Hello, I'm Paul Innes, Professor of Shakespeare Studies. Welcome to my channel, Shakespeare for All. Today, I'm going to be talking about Hamlet. This is one of three videos on the play dealing with characterisation, plot and context. And in this episode, we'll be looking at the context. At the end of the video, you'll find a discussion of key terms associated with Renaissance performance techniques. Now, I've been using the MIT online version of the text because it's easily accessible, together with the Arden third edition of the play. If you're studying for assessments, editions like that with supporting material is a good idea. If you want to know more, please remember to subscribe. Now, I do apologise for this, but it's the start of semester, so I have freshers flu. It's much worse this year, it's got nothing to do with COVID. The fact is, everybody's been away for six months and all come together and everybody's catching anything. So, and everything, if I'm stumbling at points, it's because I've got a tickle in the back of my throat, okay? Another thing I'd like to do is wave to Wendy Day. We met when we came to Cheltenham. Wendy likes to keep up with Shakespeare and she also looks in on us from time to time. So, hi Wendy. There are three main elements of the context to this play that I want to discuss today and the various speeches and characters fit into these aspects. Think of them as broad categories that run throughout the play. So we're going to do three things today. One, we're going to look at the figure of Hamlet. Two, we're going to look at how Shakespeare presents the medieval Danish setting for a London audience. And then three, what we're going to do is look at how the play would have worked on its own stage. So we're going to start with the figure of Hamlet. And there are serious issues with Hamlet because the modern perception of the Prince of Denmark is inevitably flavoured by the very long text that we tend to use. We've inherited it via a long editing process and critical tradition. This has had three main results. One, Hamlet is often considered to be a prototype for the emergence of modern individualism and selfhood. He's used by critics to psychologise the events of the play in a way that's radically different from how the play worked on its own stage. In other words, he's seen as much more of an individual because that fits our much later culture. Now, two, following on from this, his apparent inwardness, his individualism, is supposed to be demonstrated by the soliloquies because they seem to show an extreme level of introspection, inwardness. And three, his tragedy in this kind of analysis stems from his tragic flaw of thinking too much, procrastinating, not taking the action he needs to take to achieve his vengeance. So those are the three elements of Hamlet that are worth remembering. Now, our modern Hamlet was never performed on the Renaissance stage in this way because what we have is an idealised text collated from many versions. The total is much longer than would ever have been performed on its own stage. In the main, it's taken from the first folio edition and you see a photograph of that here, plus material from other earlier versions published during Shakespeare's lifetime. The whole thing added together by much later textual editors. The first folio is published in 1623, after Shakespeare's death by his theatrical company, and the quartos, which are quarter size, little ones, bits and pieces that seem appropriate to different editors are added to the folio, folio to produce the long version with which we're familiar. So logically, the Hamlet effect of a real person on the stage is actually the result of subsequent cultures' literary, printed recreation of the play. Contemporary versions are much shorter, often around two-thirds the length of the folio version, which in turn means that Hamlet's famous extended procrastination is nowhere near as pronounced in those performance versions. This makes him, in his own context, much more of a conventional revenge figure on his own stage, 
and so more appropriate to Renaissance performance culture. Basically what we're talking about is historical difference. Hamlet and his own stage, what Hamlet has become. The two are not the same. Now, if you're looking at secondary critical material while you're studying the play, you'll often find the references to things like procrastination or Hamlet's tragic flaw as explained in accordance with Aristotle's term, hamartia. Now, this may seem odd to you, but actually that's a fundamental misreading of the term as it's used in Aristotle's poetics. In the Greek original, hamartia refers to a situation outside the protagonist's control, not something that somehow exists within him or her. It's extrinsic and absolutely, in Aristotle's original formulation, absolutely not internal. The tragic problem for the protagonist in Greek culture, in Aristotle's culture, is how to negotiate this problem. <clears throat> Most often comes in the form of a dilemma or a contradiction that cannot possibly be resolved. So here's a famous example from Greek tragedy, which of course is what Aristotle was writing about. Orestes is required, absolutely by divine law, to kill the murderer of his father. He is also obliged by divine law never to commit matricide, never to kill his mother. The problem is, his mum killed his dad, right? Clytemnestra murdered Agamemnon. He can't obey one dictate that he must obey without transgressing, transgressing the other, which he must not do, so he's stuck. The result is he's driven mad by the Furies for violating a divine mandate. Ultimately, after he kills Cly Clytemnestra, it takes the intervention of the goddess Athena to resolve the situation. In other words, what happens to Orestes is not produced by a tragic flaw, but by what we would call a socially produced dilemma. In his context, it's seen as divine law. It's not internal. Now, if you apply this logic, theoretically, to the dilemma of a certain Prince Hamlet, then you can argue he's also caught in an impossible double bind that is outside himself. He's required to kill the murderer of his father, but at the same time, the killer is now the king after mar marrying Hamlet's mother Gertrude. He needs to take revenge on Claudius, who's also his new father by marriage, by committing regicide. You're not supposed to kill your father and you're not supposed to kill the king. So he's caught. If you want to apply proper Aristotelian logic, Hamlet is in an impossible dilemma. Now the advantage of this type of approach is that it accords much more closely with how the revenge figure of Hamlet would have been played on his own stage using the other shorter contemporary verses of the text. You can see where I'm going with this. Now, in fact, Aristotle is very extreme with characterization. He relegates it to a very minor place in his grand scheme of things. You can have a look at this if you don't believe me, okay? Book six of the Poetics, he states, he actually says this, there can be a tragedy without character. Right, now we are used to tragic flaws. How does that accord with what Aristotle actually writes? It doesn't. For Aristotle, the action, the plot, has primacy, not the character. Characterization supports the action, not the other way around. In a rigorous Aristotelian formulation, character does not produce the action. Okay, Remember that, it's so important. This is why figures like Lady Macbeth or Desdemona and Othello can seem contradictory to us. Once they've fulfilled their plot function, they're killed off, no matter how important they seem early in their respective plays. In other words, if you look at Shakespeare's plays in terms of their own historical context, together with Aristotle's actual views of tragedy, then psychological coherence and individualism and all that suddenly seems a lot less necessary. You could even argue it's not even remotely relevant for that culture. Now what we'll do is we'll move on to the setting. And I'm going to do kind of three things here. 
To begin with, it's worth noting that this isn't just a place set in medieval Denmark in the castle of Elsinore. It's a much later English Renaissance version of medieval Denmark, if you like it's a cultural translation. The matrilinear system of royal inheritance in Denmark isn't investigated in detail by the play. Hamlet, of course, is well aware that by marrying Gertrude, Claudius has come between him and the succession. In effect, Claudius has almost used up the throne, although he has done so in a way that is technically legal. Hamlet calls it an election in Act 5, Scene 2. But in that context, in the play, the term has more of a sense of automatic choice as opposed to what we think of as a democratic competition. By marrying Queen Gertrude before young Hamlet gets back to Denmark for his father's funeral, Claudius has effectively managed to make himself king. He's come between me and the election, Hamlet says. That's what that phrase actually means. Now secondly, you cannot avoid this issue if you're reading secondary material on the play. Freud. Okay, Freudian critics, they made a massive amount out of Hamlet's supposed desire for his own mother, incestuous. What I'm going to do is look at the occurrences of the word in the play as a way of challenging that. And here's the first one, see this on the screen. This is Hamlet at the beginning of the play. He doesn't yet know from the ghost that his father has been murdered by Claudius, but he's already talking about incest and it's got nothing to do with himself. Watch these lines, have a little look. Ere yet the salt of most unrighteous tears had left the flushing in her gullet eyes, she married. Oh, most wicked speed to post with such dexterity to incestuous sheets. Now he then meets the ghost, and the ghost uses the same word. Again, not about young Hamlet, okay? I, that incestuous, that adulterate beast, this is on the screen for you, with witchcraft of his wit, with traitorous gifts, blah, blah, blah. One to his shameful lust, the will of my most seeming virtuous queen. Oh, Hamlet, what a falling off was there. Next one from slightly later in the same scene. The ghost is saying to Hamlet, his son, let not the royal bed of Denmark be a couch for luxury and damned incest. And then he goes on to say, you know, leave your mother's conscience alone. Later in the famous chapel scene when Hamlet has the opportunity to kill Claudius while the new king is praying, he decides not to do so because he doesn't want just to avenge his father's death. That's not enough for a revenge figure in this context, in this culture, in this play. You have to be excessive. He doesn't just want to kill the guy, he wants to damn him forever, okay? That's why he chooses not to proceed. And the word incestuous turns up again. He says, up, sword. So he's got his sword out, he's thinking of killing the guy, and he says, no, I'm not going to do it. Up, sword, I know thou a more horrid hint. When he is drunk asleep, or in his rage, or in the incestuous pleasure of his bed, at gaming, swearing, or about some act that has no relish of salvation in it, then trip him that his heels may kick at heaven right he's basically saying get him kill him when he's doing something sinful like incestuous pleasure in his bed and here's the final one this is what he says to claudius as he's basically just stabbed a guy and then he's forcing the poisoned contents of a goblet down his throat killing him twice if you like I about said about it being excessive hear thou incestuous murderous damned dane drink off this potion is that union here follow my mother he says so hamlet's not a particularly nice guy when he's killing people so these are the five instances of the term incest or its cognates in the play not one of them is about hamlet's supposed desire for his mother rather they are all concerned with the incestuous marital union between gertrude and claudius and the reason for this is that they were already related via marriage prior to this point as brother and sister-in-law, right? The, this comes within the forbidden degrees of possible remarriage according to the laws of the Catholic Church. And this is the third point beginning to come up. Now, the technical term for this situation is incest by affinity, okay? A prior close non-blood relation not covered by blood kin kinship, and there's a very precise English 
Renaissance resonance because this is exactly what Henry VIII did. Okay? He married his brother's widow, Catherine of Aragon. He got a dispensation from the Pope saying that in this instance it wasn't incestuous, so he went and married her. When he failed to produce a male heir by that union, she got the blame. He decided that it was incestuous all along, and the Pope was wrong to say it wasn't, because it suited him. Okay? He then went on to marry Anne Boleyn, the mother of Elizabeth I, and we know how that turned out as well. So if you think about it historically, Incest in the play has absolutely nothing to do with Hamlet and Gertrude. It's about Claudius and Gertrude. So, although the play is set in medieval Catholic Denmark, it's marked by its own context, like the Henry VIII associations. It's a context of Protestant Renaissance England, specifically London. Now, the sense of unease with which the play begins, with its dead king roaming the battlements, is picked up by the soldiers on guard duty, as well as by Horatio and Marcellus. Hamlet also is aware that something's wrong. Okay? We've seen this. Especially since by marrying his mother, his uncle Claudius has very swiftly taken advantage of his own brother's death. Hamlet doesn't yet know he's been murdered by the guy, okay? To gain the throne unseemly haste as Hamlet is very quick to note very early on in the play. It all just seems too convenient. Now the revelations of the ghost explain the situation but there are elements of Catholicism in the play which might seem a bit superstitious to a Protestant audience like references to the Catholic idea of purgatory, a sort of waiting room between heaven and hell, where sinners who are not bad enough to be thrown into hell, but aren't good enough to go into heaven yet, are purged of their sins before they can go through the pearly gates. Now, in this context, this is anachronistic, but Shakespeare's audience had no problem with this. It's no coincidence that Hamlet has just come from studying in Germany in Wittenberg, Many people in Shakespeare's audience would know that city is famously associated with a certain Martin Luther, the guy who started the Reformation. So the figure of Hamlet is loaded with dangerous revolutionary associations from a Catholic point of view. This means that Claudius is well aware from the outset of a potential threat posed by the return of his nephew. So now what we'll do is we will move on to the final part of this video, effectively, uh, before we look at some key terms. We're talking about English Renaissance performance culture. Now, it might seem odd to include this as part of a discussion of context, but it's central to this play. Hamlet contains many of the staging resources available to English Renaissance dramatists. We'll discuss these in turn and provide you with a list of key terms we use when we talk about performance in this period. Now, it can seem a bit strange to keep reminding you this is a play, but if you can include some of these concepts and terminology in an assessment, you show your examiner that you're well aware of the main conventions and techniques of Renaissance English drama as Shakespeare uses them in this play. It makes an excellent primer for the culture and techniques of the Renaissance drama on the public stage. Very similar to performance comments I make in the video about context for Othello, but this time I'm going to use examples that are specific to Hamlet. So the terms which we use, one, I've used this one already, exposition, the process that reveals elements of the plot and the way they relate to one another. Now this play begins with various characters, referring to a palpable sense of unease hanging over Elsinore, which is then explained to Hamlet by the ghost of his father, thus setting the plot in motion. Now, what this means is that the unease that Hamlet feels, the fact that the audience has already seen the soldiers meeting the ghost, along with Horatio and Marcellus, foreshadows that something's rotten in the state of Denmark, as they say. Second phrase, not just a single term, but a phrase, is emblematic characterization. In this play, there is a moment where we see a minor character who acts as a sort of comment on the overall action of the play. He doesn't add to the plot, but he does allow Hamlet to say some things about the way that Claudius runs the country. The sudden arrival of the completely non-existent courtier Osric, suddenly this little guy turns up in Act 5, Scene 2, 
to invite Hamlet to the duel with Laertes, allows Hamlet to make some really nasty remarks to Horatio about, you know, look at the kind of courtier that runs Denmark nowadays under my uncle. This is repugnant. It's effectively a definition of how Claudius is ruling the country by the prince who is the rival for the throne. It's not exactly neutral. Now, this play is famous for Hamlet's constant use of soliloquy which is direct address to the audience. This disrupts what we tend to think of as the fourth wall, because in fact, there can't be one on that stage. It's phys physically impossible. This means that the stage factor of Hamlet often directly interacts with the audience. So remember that, that's how soliloquies work on that stage. We also have a very, very good example, or several examples in the play of split staging. I just want to mention the famous closet scene where Hamlet confronts his mother and mistakenly kills Polonius, who he thinks is Claudius. Polonius is hiding behind an arras. Polonius is supposedly about to become Hamlet's father-in-law, except Hamlet kills him. Okay? An arras is a tapestry hanging on the wall. He makes a noise and is discovered by Hamlet, who thrusts his weapon through the fabric to kill him, hoping it's the king. Okay, split staging. Things are happening differently on different parts of the stage. Now, as well as a soliloquy, there are many instances of the aside in this play. Various characters make comments about one another to the audience directly. The convention usually is that the comments are unheard by the other characters on the stage. The overall effect is one of people watching and commenting on other people to the audience all the way through the play. Everybody in this court is watching everybody else. Everybody. A couple of technical terms. These, these are obvious ones for you. Protagonist, the main character. Sometimes there's more than one. Obviously, in this play, it's a guy called Hamlet. The antagonist is the main opponent to the protagonist. So, obviously, in this play, it's Claudius. Coming back to acting techniques, what I want to do is draw your attention to a stage location, which is the trap door. The stage trap in the centre of the floor is often symbolically associated with the underworld. This has its roots in the voice figure from the English medieval dramatic tradition, which is a kind of ancestor of the Revenger, Hamlet. Hamlet as Revenger takes on elements of the voice and, famously, fights Laertes in Ophelia's grave. It's a classic example of the use of the trapdoor. Now, Renaissance tragedy is very aware of its own artificiality. You'll see phrases like self-aware tragedy. Other terms include metatheatre or metadrama. For example, at the very end of Hamlet, when Fortinbras, basically, who's now the ruler of Norway, pretty much turns up on the stage, Horatio describes the events that have just taken place in the form of a tragedy, conventional terms associated with tragedy. A classic example of this awareness of its own artificiality is the play within the play, the famous mouse trap in Act 3, Scene 2. Very common in Renaissance drama. Not limited to tragedy, think about the dreadful, funnily dreadful, at Pyramus and Tisby in A Midsummer Night's Dream. It's a very common convention. The use of a playlet, a play within the play, draws attention to stage artifice, even as it's being used by Hamlet, in this case, to tease out the truth of what Claudius has done to his own brother, according to the ghost of old Hamlet. Um, young Hamlet is using it to prick the king's conscience to get a reaction out of him to see what he's doing. It's a play being used within a play by someone watching events. Now, I'm going to give you a technical term here to finish off. This is specularity. It's a modern critical term, specularity, used to describe a specific type of stage logic. Now, because the public Renaissance stage has no fourth wall, there's much more of a sense of collusion between at least some of the actors and the audience. This is the performance culture that surrounds the figure of Hamlet on his own stage. It explains the way this play makes use of soliloquies and asides. Specularity, though, has a much deeper logic than just this series of techniques. It refers to the way in which this, place, this play in particular is especially 
careful to stage people watching, people watching, people, everybody, as I said a few minutes ago, everybody watches one another. Happens all the way through. Claudius gets Polonius to set Ophelia to spy in Hamlet. Polonius gets himself killed, doing exactly that himself. The same thing also happens to Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. The use of the mouse trap, play within a play, is a superb example of how this theatre uses the resources of its own staging to draw attention to a poisonous atmosphere of people constantly spying on one another. So, we've looked at the figure of Hamlet, we've looked at the implications of the play being set in Catholic medieval Denmark, while being performed in Protestant Renaissance London, and we've rounded it all together with a look at the way the play uses contemporary performance techniques. Now, good luck with your studies, and if you want to know more, we also have videos on plot and characterisation for Hamlet, so please remember to subscribe.